All right. So our first chapter is going to be introduction to information architecture. There you go. So information architecture is the organization of content so that it's understandable and readily obtainable. The end goal is to ensure that users find the information they need and complete tasks. To accomplish this, you must have a baseline understanding of how that information is presented through systems and accessed by your users. All right, information architecture and user experience design. You may have heard these two terms be used interchangeably. While they are related, they have completely different goal, end goals in mind. So think of information architecture as the foundation and blueprint of a product, system, or service. It provides a clear path for users that makes it easier for them to, to navigate through. It is a key aspect of UX that provides, prioritizes organizing information and proper structuring. And then you have user experience or UX design, which is the process of how users both engage and experience that same product, system, or service. It is the finished product that information architecture has helped to build. The user's emotions are always at the forefront and utilized with user-centered design practices. User experience ex ensures that you're having fun while navigating. Ultimately, they go hand in hand, so having good information architecture is required if you want good user experience design. Okay, so why is this important? Well, I think everybody on this call can probably agree that uh, time and energy are probably our most precious commodity to us and our users are no different. I mean, we're users too. We go to websites and look for stuff all the time. Um, so if we're making something too complicated or it's too slow to find information, our visitor is probably going to get frustrated and abandon the site. And then in the future, they're less likely to come back and which is really hard to get them back. Um, so information architecture is to help get them to the information they need, the tasks they need to accomplish, um, and it's the backbone of this user experience that they have. Um, so information architects, that includes you, uh, is their job is to create an experience that allows the users, user to focus on their tasks versus finding their way around. Um, so <clears throat> doing that can help the user feel more positive about the organization, department, or school. Um, so uh, Jesse, next. There we go. <laughs> so it'll it'll help with the brand impression of of who you are. They're going to get a good vibe about you. They're going to be happy because they can find the information quickly and easily. Um, and then another benefit would be that users will return to your site as a trusted source of information. Uh, and what that'll do is not only make them happy, like in the brand impression part, but it also could result in less support calls to you because they're finding the information they need. They're not trying to find somebody to give it to them. It's a, like a true tool at that point. So defining information architecture objectives. Information architecture has three main objectives that are required to accomplish its purpose. Findability, understandability, and utility. These objectives are relative and closely affect one another. So starting off with findability. So as the name suggests, is about making information easier to find. Some information is readily obtainable, such as knowing what items you need to purchase at the grocery store because you made a list. You use that list as your source of truth regarding what you have to buy. But there can also be information that's harder to find as well. You may not know where it is, what it's called, or that it even exists. In this instance, you only become closer to what you're looking for as you progress, but it will take effort. For your users, this can be discouraging, and could cause them to not return back to your site. So you have to make sure that your content is easily accessible. Then moving on to understandability, which is making sense of that information when provided with both context and its relation to concepts you already understand. So for example, a film and TV tracking app might allow you to view series and films by genre or year of release. Depending on what you're trying to accomplish, either option can be useful. The key here is that you already have a baseline understanding of what genres and release dates are. So without this, you won't be able to make sense of it and will be unable to choose logically. Additionally, context matters. Things could be understood differently based on where and how it's encountered. 
you understand a film being shown at a movie theater different, differently than watching it at home. So now that you made your information findable and understandable, now what? Well, what does that information have value? What is it good for? What purpose does it serve? This is where utility comes into play. Let's say you started working out at the gym and are looking at the machines. You find one that seems relatively easy to use and you have a basic understanding that is for your arms. When you look over the instructions on the machine, you see that its purpose is to target your biceps. Now that you've assigned value to the machine, you can continue to use it or move on to one that fulfills your needs. The same can be applied to your users and ensuring the information you have provides value that they can use. So with information architecture generating these three components, order is constructed. With order, information is organized in a specific manner and even provides the means for users to do it themselves. So moving on to the three components of information architecture. So there are three elements that must be present in order to achieve both good information architecture and a satisfactory user experience. Ontology is giving labels to individually, excuse me, identify identifiable elements so that users understand what they're looking at. Once the label is determined, then we can decide where it needs to be placed with the help of taxonomy, which is when those elements are grouped, classified, and labeled together within a shared information environment. This ar arrangement of elements accomplish specific goals within or across contexts. And then you have choreography, which is the movement or user flow that the user is most likely to take in order to accomplish their task. It requires both ontology and taxonomy to work together and once mastered, will achieve a positive user experience every time. So a quick example of this process can be applied to a user that is interested in attending USF. With ontology, we can give them the label of a student and taxonomy further categorizes them as a graduate student, for example. Once that information is established, we can then determine the choreography or user flow that they will take to apply to USF to earn their master's degree. So the interplay of ontology, taxonomy, and choreography can't be simply designed. It needs to be architected first. OK. So a lot of these principles will kind of overlap and they'll echo each other. So you'll kind of hear that here too. Um, so this is a model of information architecture that was created by some of the founders of information architecture. Um, much of the terminology terminology we use, like when we're doing this foundational stuff, can seem uh, technical or a little jargony. Um, so some of these thinkers got together and they tried to put it in a little bit more basic terms. Um, so the three pillars, the first one is context. So every site can have different goals. So let's say uh, admission site is trying to attract new students, uh, where the HR site is trying to get people to relevant information about forms and processes, uh, different goals, but the fact that they have goals is part of context. Uh, so the context refers to a site's goals that it has or expectations of the organization itself, uh, resources that'll be used to create this thing. Um, the technology tools available, the constraints that you have on the project, and the culture. Um, all that builds into the context of the site. It's kind of the other things outside of the other two pillars, which, which are a little more clear. Um, the next one is users. This is the second pillar. Uh, and this is the audience that comes in to receive your content. They want to uh, absorb it and retrieve it. Um, they want to complete tasks, things like that. Uh, so for the users, we can expand on that a little bit more because they're kind of the key here. And we'll come back to this a lot, which is that we're trying to look at the users in a holistic way um, by building empathy for them, which is highly important. Uh, you really need to walk a mile in your user's shoes if you, if you can um, and analyze their goals, their needs, the tasks they want to accomplish, their comfort with technology. Are they coming to your site only on mobile? So all these things kind of factor into this user empathy model. Uh, another thing you can use in this thing to define your users is analytics. Uh, kind of look at their behavior, where they're going, their path through the site, as Jesse mentioned a minute ago. Um, and then another aspect of analyzing them would be user feedback or user testing. Uh, things like having them think aloud to you and talk to you about how they would go through your site without even seeing it is an exercise. 
Uh, another one would be to observe them actually clicking through your site. So this feedback and the analytics and the empathy all helps you create a picture of this user. Um, and it's a big, I think it's a big pillar of these three principles. Uh, and the last one would be content, which is pretty easy to wrap your head around because it's everything else. It's your data, your documents, your copy, the images, the media. And so they put these three pillars together and the intersection of the three uh, is information architecture. Uh, next slide, Jesse. So information architecture rests in the intersection of these three very important things. So the essential aspects of information architecture. All right, so organization of system is the distribution of information within identifiable categories so that they're easier to find. Within the system are two main components, structures and schemes. So starting off with schemes, they are how the information is arranged and put into related groups. Here are some popular schemes. So you have alphabetical, self-explanatory, content is arranged in alphabetical order. So this scheme works best when the users already knows what they're looking for. Then you have audience. The content is arranged for a certain group of users. An example of this would be an educational resource making the content uh, separated by skill level. So you have beginner, intermediate, um, expert, and so on. Then you have chronological, another self-explanatory scheme, which is organized by date and time, perfect for news blogs, um, news posts, blogs, events, apps, timelines, and so on. And then the final one, which is topic, where is a scheme uh, where the content is arranged by sp specific subject, so for instance, browsing, once again, a film and TV show database by genre. So I have provided some examples of schemes that I have found within USF. So you have the undergraduate catalog, everything's organized alphabetically. Then a audience example would be how each of the supply to USF is uh, separated by what type of student you are. So freshman, transfer, graduate students, international students. Then chronological example would be um, the newsfeed. So you can separate it, go in through which year you want to find, or you could just view the newsfeed by default, um, how it is. And then topic, same thing with the newsfeed. You can go in and choose which category you want to focus on. And then you have the little tags at the bottom, Campus Live, University News, and so on. So now structures. So structures, on the other hand, categorize information so that the user can easily navigate through or to it. There are a few main types of structures. Hierarchical structures distribute information under exclusive categories ranked by importance, much like taxonomy that I went over earlier. This type of structure can also be viewed or achieved visually with differing alignments, colors, sizes, contrasts, and so on. And then you have sequential sequential structures uh, that present information in a logical path that is arranged in chronological order. Think of it as a step-by-step -step process when cooking a new recipe. You, you must complete one step before proceeding to the next. And then lastly, matrix structures are the most complicated out of the three as the information was organized and navigated by the indiv individual user themselves. How they access and find information can be done by searching for specific topics or dates. Think of it as browsing the internet. There's no one way they can go about it. So again, I have presented some examples. So hierarchical examples of structures that I found on USF sites. So the left one is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have the headers and you have the normal text and everything is grouped under where they need to go. And then on the right side is more of a visual hierarchy where you have the big text and then the little images and then the small text. So everything flows very nice and appeasing to the eye. And then I have sequential example where uh, a person would be coming in to apply. So they have to fill out their information and then go on through that step and process. And then finally, a uh, matrix example. This was a little difficult to find, but I think this applies pretty well. So a user can go in and they can search um, their course or a student, sorry, will go in and search for their course. 
by subject, they can search by the ca uh, section category, by the degree works, and they have more free range. It's not just straightforward, one route they can take. They can find the courses that they need through multiple ways. Okay, so this section talks about labeling and labeling systems. So it's this probably will make sense to you is that uh, good labeling should be intuitive uh, and depict the meaning of the button or the section or the option that they're choosing. Uh, simplicity here is key uh, and user empathy, which we'll keep kind of circling back to and hopefully some testing if you have time to do it is crucial. Uh, that way, the user, when they get there, they see exactly what they need. They go straight to it. I mean, you can't you can't always make it everything to everyone. That's really hard, but uh, you try to hit the biggest percentage that you can. Uh, for example, good labeling is intuitive in that if you labeled something information on your site, that would be way too generic. It would be something like about us and that kind of narrows it down for someone. Or uh, back in the day, it used to be common on sites to put services as a, like a navigation link, <clears throat> and it was like way too broad. Uh, but for your organization, it might be you break services into advising and mentoring, uh, and that makes a lot more sense and guides users more effectively. Uh, so most of what we will do is textual lab labeling, so headings and things like that. Uh, but it also extends to icon iconography and graphics. So you have to look at an icon and make sure it's intuitive when describing whatever information it's trying to, to represent. Uh, the home icon is a good example. On many systems, you'll see a home icon, on it, and it's all variations of a house, uh, and that's pretty intuitive. Uh, it gets trickier when you get to things like press releases, like how do I represent that in an icon? Uh, but here are some examples from calls to action that we have on several sites that kind of represent themselves well in an icon. So navigation systems. So this is probably the one information architecture system that you are all the most familiar with. Navigation is the system that allows visitors to easily locate what they're looking for. Easily locate is the key word here, as regardless to which page they land on first, they should always be able to still find what they need without issue. You may have seen information architecture and navigation be used interchangeably, but they are not the same. Navigation is, once again, a system within information architecture. You should also never focus primarily on navigation when building out a new site. So when in, in the early stages of a new website, you don't know the full scope of its content and functionality. A navigation system might include any of the following, main navigation interface, sub-navigation menus, breadcrumbs, and pagination. So there are four main types of navigation that you've again seen multiple times across USF's web domain. So you have hier hierarchical, which is the flow of navigation starts from top to bottom. There is a clear information hierarchy of elements within their respective category. This can commonly, commonly be seen with drop down menus. So for this one, you have the about USF, that's the top header uh, parent page, and then you have the child pages below overview, mission and goals, and so on. Then you have global or site-wide navigation where it is always present no matter what page you're on. It can be in the header, on the sides, in the footer, as a sticky menu, or even as a hamburger menu. So I've shown that with USF's default uh, header menu um, and how it looks on mobile and then the footer. Then you have local uh, navigation, which is shown within a specific area, such as a section within a page. This is normally a navigation system that only contains sub navigation content that is exclusive to that department. So, of course, I use the UCM's <laughs> uh, section. So, you have the brand assets, that's everything shown, and then that will link to their respective sub pages. And then the final one, which is contextual navigation system, the elements uh, are in relation to the content that it shares a page with. So, this is very commonly seen with sites that have a blog or news feature. If there are similar articles to the one the user is currently reading, then they'll be able to access it right there on the same page. So again, I use uh, USF's news page, and on the side you have all the related 
or you can quickly jump to what's the current um, article. And then you also have the tags too, which that helps if you want to jump to something similar. Okay. So search is probably one of the most effective ways to find information on sites. I mean, how many times a day do I Google something? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of have to take this into account uh, as a way to navigate and as part of IA. Uh, for example, 62% of the traffic to usf.edu comes via search, uh, which is impressive, whether you're using Google or Bing or something else. Uh, so we want to make sure that our content is searchable because this is so important. Um, so a good exercise you can do yourself is just to go and Google your information as if you were one of your users. Uh, you can use the USF search or the Google search is probably the most applicable uh, and, and see what comes up. So to help search engines find and index your content effectively, you want to first update your metadata um, on each page. Uh, and the reason this is important is because the titles and descriptions on, in that metadata are used in the search results. Uh, so having that really, really clear uh, helps users find your information because when they search, boom, it's right there. They can scan it really quickly, see if it's what they need and go. Um, You'll also notice in this on this slide in the lower left is this actual CMS backend where you would actually edit this metadata. You also notice keywords down there. This used to be a critical thing in your metadata that was used by search engines, but it's kind of uh, gone out of favor because some people abused the keywords metadata tag. And uh, so Google really no longer looks at that anymore. So you don't need to worry about that. This is obviously left over from when it did matter and we put it in there um, very effectively and it worked, but it no longer does. So you don't have to focus on that. Title and description are very important. And as you can see, um, the Google result and the also the USF search result uses that title and description in the result itself. Um, also, another note about that is you want your content on your site and your pages to be concise, clear, and quality, which is kind of nebulous, but quality uh, means that it's just straight to the point. There's no like over flowery stuff um, and that helps the search engine index it better and makes it because they actually analyze your pages to the quality of the content. Um, uh, the next thing is accessibility. Um, accessibility matters always. Uh, it's important that everyone can get to your content and everyone can can uh, take it in in whatever manner they need to. Uh, and it's also important in search. Uh, for example, a good example is alt text and images. Uh, you want very effective alt text for accessibility, not only for accessibility, but it also helps in the search ability. Uh, that does come up in search results as well. Things like well-structured headers uh, is important to accessibility. It's also important to the search engine, and it's also important to help anyone navigate the site accessibility or otherwise. Uh, so yeah, search. Um, it okay, looks... go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, okay, so in this section, we are both going to be sharing um, examples where we have implemented information architecture and to show how you could do the same and see real world examples within the UX sphere of how they do it. Okay. So the preface, um, I wanted to give a quick preface on some terminology before jumping to our own examples. So you have the uh, site maps, which presents the entire structure of a website, usually shown in a hierarchical manner with the homepage at the top. It does not offer details on the links between the pages or the external pages a website leads to. Then you have card sorting, which is a method used to help design or evaluate the information architecture of the site, normally done in sessions where participants logically organize topics into categories, and it's also helpful with labeling. Can be done using actual cards, pieces of paper, or digital software. And then finally, wireframes, which are uh, two-dimensional illustrations of a page's interface structure. Typically in black and white, as the focus is on space allocation, placement of content, available functionalities, and intended behaviors. 
Okay, for structure and sitemap, I have an example of the HR site that we redesigned uh, 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. Uh, so this is the before of their sitemap. Uh, in, the, in the bottom, it's so tiny, it's really hard to see, but uh, that was their sitemap originally. Uh, and all the content kind of was housed in this one single area of the site. It's that that bluish color. Uh, and so it was very shocking to see and, and it's kind of really broad as well. Uh, and so this is kind of kind of where we started uh, on the next slide. You'll see uh, we went through many exercises, interviews, testing, all kinds of things to kind of land here, which was a little bit more balanced. We got people to content in different ways. Uh, and this was the map that we came up with afterwards where we navigated by persona as well. Um, so it was it was a, a vastly better structure than we had previously. This has changed since then too. The sites are never done uh, because you're constantly analyzing what works and what doesn't work and then adjusting uh, as you can. Um, so this is where we ended up eventually. Okay, next one. We also did the card sorting exercise uh, that Jesse just described. We did it physically. Uh, so we wrote everything on little slips of paper and put them out and we had uh, people in pairs go and kind of put things in buckets where they thought they went and then also labeled the bucket as to where they went. And then we took pictures of everything and then we used that to inform the sitemap you just saw before. Uh, and then this is an example of the wireframes that we came up with. There was also like uh, paper drawings. Uh, there was quite a few of those, but I don't, I don't have any images of those. I probably should try to dig them up. Uh, but we started with that and then we ended up in a, the one on the left is like a wireframe that we do in a PDF. Some of you may recognize them uh, from when uh, we would have you do wireframes for the CMS site, for new CMS sites. Uh, so we use that to figure out where the information would go. And like, like Jesse said, it's very black and white. You're not thinking about graphics and, and things like that. You're really focused on the information and where, where it is and where it is on the page and how people get to things. And then finally on the right, we actually built out something in the CMS, uh, clearly older design of the CMS, and that was something we could actually click through. And this was another wireframe slash prototype that we could interact with, but not focus on the imagery just yet. All right, so for my example, I chose my junior year project called Food Binge. So Food Binge is a app that allows users to store ingredients they already own, find recipes that those uh, to use those ingredients and shop at grocery stores from the comfort of their home. The project's goals were separated into three, three categories, a search feature for recipes that a user wants to try, the ability to browse recipes after filtering dietary preferences, rating and difficulty, and then after choosing a recipe, the user can order the nece necessary ingredients within the app. For the sake of this workshop, I will only focus on two aspects within the project that went towards building its information architecture. So this was the search, sort, and retrieval um, thing that we built out. The user can search for specific recipes by stating their name in a standard search or use the categories provided to find something that fits within those parameters. Categories fall under large groups like food types, for specific ingredients involved, meal types to limit the search to specific foods appropriate for that time of day or the meal, and then individualized categories demonstrated in the list below, such as uh, lunches for kids, date nights, and so on. Once inside the category, the user can either search through the shown recipes or filter through content even more with more categories available. They will then be able to select from a specifically curated list to find a recipe that suits them. And then um, our low and mid fidelity wireframes. So the wireframes were created through rough, sketch, rough sketches and Figma. They help tremendously with keeping user experience in mind with focusing on the actions of the application. So such as selecting a store, uh, adding an item to the card and checking out. And this is the final prototype that we made. Um, my team wanted to focus on the main feature of the app which is browsing groceries and recipes. We made sure to include a search and filter system, navigation system, proper labeling, and organized information under appropriate categories. When asked after <laughs> the testing if 
um, there were any critiques, the user stated that it was structured in a relatively straightforward manner, making it easy to navigate and understand. So in the chat, yes, Grace had linked uh, the prototype and the case study. If you are interested in going through this prototype yourself and reading the full case study with all the UX fun stuff. <laughs> Uh, so, as we mentioned uh, in, in, and alluded to in several things here, is that uh, there are a lot of ways to dig deeper into your users, uh, and this bleeds. This goes from information architecture to and goes into user experience as well. Um, there are a lot of exercises that you can do that we've some of them we might have touched on. Um, things like personas when you're building empathy for your users, interviews. Um, you can do uh, more things in analytics, obviously, like funnels and conversions. Uh, and then user testing is a really great thing if you have the time, even if it's only one or two people. Uh, things like A-B testing, uh, going back to analytics and actually testing it on the users, uh, prototyping, having them go through exercises where they try to accomplish a task and you observe what they're doing. Um, so these are things that are kind of the next level and it's things you can look up on your own, or it could be the subject of a future workshop that we do here. Um, but we just wanted to show those to you. Questions. You can feel free to put them in the chat or ask us live, whatever you wish. Yeah, oh, actually, Col Colton did it. Yeah, already. Colton, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, Wayne. Uh, so. A B testing within the CMS. Currently, we don't have that functionality in there, but our CMS does have that ability. Uh, it's something that I think is an add on. So we have to we'll look into that, though. Um, but yeah, we have seen it at our most recent conference for the CMS. So we'll look at it and get back to you. Thanks, Colton. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Workshop on analytics and event tracking. Mm hmm. Really yes, yes, yes. Uh, and we're actually going through a huge transition right now, as you may know, with GA4. It's a whole new way that Google Analytics will work. And so it's actually going to affect how we do this event tracking and look at analytics as well. So we'll probably, Grace, be looking at that to see if there's something we can do in a workshop, future workshop. 